Uh, I promise that the talk will be in English, so it will be in English. <laughs> uh, and first, a disclaimer. This is a Java conference. Most of the people, when they hear continuous, they see development, integration, like a CI, CD. This talk has nothing in common with anything that's code related. It's all about people, it's all about developing ourselves, it's all about team. Uh, basically, uh, teamwork, building teams, working in teams, stuff like that. Uh, basically, if you're interested in that, welcome. <laughs> That will be like the third soft side skill talk during this day. Um, so we got two rules. First rule is you're coming here because you want to learn something. So if you got any questions, raise your hand. I don't mind interruptions. That's not a problem. It's all about you. Second rule is if you don't like the talk and you decide at some point of time that you really want to learn about all of the interesting things that are out there, Feel free. I don't mind. I, it's being recorded. I will be talking even to an empty room. You won't spoil anyone's fun. It's important that you take out, out something from this conference. OK, uh, about myself. You can reach me out via various uh, channels. And I will make a small disclaimer, because if you re read my bio, you've seen that picture. You haven't seen that one. I'm a geek. I'm a developer at heart. When there's a fire drill, I take my laptop. I work in the parking lot. That's who I am. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm and by education, I was learned how to work with code, not with people. I'm not a psychologist, uh, so social whatever. I'm I'm not educated to teach others, but I do a lot about. Uh, that kind of a stuff in community and on a daily work. So I started my journey with just tweeting, writing blog, um, and then I started to go to tech talks. I started to go to Java user group in Free City. Now I'm one of the people that are running the thing still after a couple of years. I attend to conferences and sometimes I organize conferences. So this is the community part where I'm taking the experience and try to share it with you. Like I mentioned, by education, I'm an engineer. Then someone called me, for whatever reason, a leader. And now they made me a manager. So I'm the guy from males. So by experience at work, uh, I also use that stuff. So if you're expecting, like Swavik said, a professor that's really educated in the books. Uh, sorry, I'm not the guy. Uh, however, I still will share some things. And first of all, why does it matter? Why, ma why teamwork and building teams and working well with others matters? Why does it matter for you? So I just love that. I adore it. It's beautiful. It's I am a way of explaining Scrum. Uh, it's super simple, but you can also notice one thing. All of those characters out there, there's plenty of them. Some of them, uh, you can see those characters in various places. You will see the same faces, basically. But some of them are only in one role, and in one place, for a very simple reason. I, I won't be going deep into that, but let's go for the basics. The team is, consistent, uh, is consisting from various people. It's not like uh, one person coding in his basement to the sound of his server, because it's cool. It's not 60s, 50s, or whatever it was. You basically have some, someone in your team, and you have to know how to work with them. So it will matter. And even if you look at those anime characters, they are different on various axes. The most obvious ones that we usually think about when we have a group of people working together, you will notice that they're ladies and gentlemen, right? It's incredible, because in the room, we got quite a lot of women. Good ladies. <laughs> Good for you. Welcome. Uh, so usually in our industry, uh, the ratio is not the best. And there are actually uh, scientific papers uh, through which I was going that says that mixed teams uh, are performing better. And by mixed, I mean uh, they took 100% male teams, 100% female teams, and couple of teams on a different scale of mixing 
ratio of women and men. And it turns out that the more diverse team was, the better the results. The other obvious thing that's happening even in this country, and by saying even in this country, I mean that land where no one wanted to go to, but people were going out. Right now, I got a lot of Brazilian guys, a lot of uh, Ukrainians, a lot of uh, Italian, even I got Italians at work in my office in Gdańsk. And it's incredible because those people are thinking different. The easiest example will be if you will think about Japanese people. And you will have them in your team. And if you don't have them right now, you will have them soon. And if you will go to UK, where a lot of us are going uh, from this country, there will be even bigger diversity. Think about Japanese. In Japan, the basic assumption is that you are a part of society. You don't try to stand out. There's a line drawn which will tell you how to go from your place to the train station. There's a place on that train station where you have to stand. You, you don't go to the sides. You basically wait for your turn and go in. While in Poland, when I see the line, the first thing that I think about is how to hell hack it. How, how will I make it to go as a first person? And all of those assumptions, or all of those visible assumptions about us, because gender or uh, nationality is super visible, right? All of them matter because it makes how we generate ideas. There is, though, a very different scale. Even if you have people from one country, one region, there is something called personality types. And there are tools that allow you to measure it uh, and use it. So I name just a couple of most popular ones. I don't encourage you to use them heavily, but go out and check them. There is a link, 16personalities.com. It's the simplest and most accessible of getting into MBTI, which is quite old technique. It's open, so there's like a billion other pages, but that one, from all I've seen, is the easiest one to get to. Basically, Mayor's Bricks, out of all of those, it's this simple grid. It's uh, 16 types of result where you will fit a person and it will describe you how the person will behave in different social si situations. Why does it matter for you? You're not building a team. And if you do, th th that matters. But I don't build a team. I'm a developer. How does it matter? Well, first of all, uh, it could tell you, even if you won't test your friends, because I'm not encouraging you to test the friends, but just to read what are the possibilities, it may open your eyes uh, to, OK, why that person behaves such a way in that situation? What are the reasons? Well, it's probably because one of those types is kicking in. That's how the person is programmed. Uh, this is her default. We know usually things like introvert, extrovert, stuff like that. Any of those tests, uh, except MBTI, is proprietary. You have to pay for it. So most, though, will give you some kind of an example. So you can go, for example, for Thomas uh, profiles and check out some samples. It helps. So let's assume it matters. Let's assume that team matters. We know how to, that the people are different. We have to work with them. We will learn about the differences. And I will be coming back to the team every time. If I will forget about it, if you won't understand how does it relate to the teamwork, uh, let me know. Uh, I'll try to explain it. Let's start from uh, hard cases. Who been, who, be, who been here last year on my talk or two years ago? There's one person, good. <laughs> uh, so I won't be repeating that for many of you. Uh, and I will try to go fast through it. Because if, if you'll check my previous year's talk, I was talking about something called imposter syndrome. And it was long. I don't have 40 minutes just for imposter syndrome. So I will go quite fast uh, through it. The slides will be available. So don't worry if you won't read everything. So there is something where condition where people are afraid to say what they are thinking. They are afraid to, of being discovered. They are afraid that some person may notice that they don't know really something and uh, then be punished in some way. So there are five or six questions, basically, which most people recommend you to ask yourself. And if you will, and it also uh, differs, but if you will answer to at least half of them positively, there's a chance that you're susceptible to that thing called imposter syndrome. 
I use open images, I use open definitions, so that from Wiki from some time ago. And basically, imposter syndrome is a cognitive bias, so it's a mental state, where a highly intelligent person capable of doing stuff, and really, usually really good at doing that stuff, is incapable. Uh, the people cannot basically believe in themselves. Uh, as an example, as a developer, I don't believe that I'm writing a good code. I want to go, uh, when I'm angry that something failed again, I always say to myself, I will go to north of Norway just to plow snow. Why? Because it's simpler. Uh, as a team leader, I'm a failure because some people left my team. Despite we delivered earlier, despite that we're making a great job and client is giving us feedback, I, that person left me. They will fire me now. They will discover that I know, don't know anything about what I'm doing. So a couple of years ago, when I had issues with it, and I discovered that definition, my mood just skyrocketed. I started to read more and more and more. I was so hyped that, OK, maybe I'm not so crappy developer, team lead, whatever role I had. Maybe I'm imposter. And then I discovered something else. There is something called Dunning-Kruger effect. Those are two guys that even got a prize for it, Nobel Prize for it. They discovered that there's a different bias. Very stupid people uh, usually think about themselves very highly. If you listen to Slavic, the people that are afraid to go on the stage may have that. They know that mm, I will go out, they will ask me a question, and it will be an issue. <laughs> so uh, then my super hyped energy just plummeted. Uh, it went off the table. And I'll try to show you how to uh, make a difference between those two. But in the middle, uh, let's assume you don't have it. Y you're not an imposter, so it doesn't matter, right? You can go on with your life or wait for the rest of the talk. Uh, well, not. Probably you work with someone, what we agreed on the very beginning, we are working in teams, or you have family, friends, you have someone that you want to help, so sorry. Uh, so why does it matter on a daily basis? Uh, what it can cause? And I will be coming to why question, because I like it. So it may influence other people's work. Imagine a meeting. We got an expert, uh, let's say, from in insurance industry. So everyone assume that if I'm an expert uh, on insurances and we are developing a new product, then probably I have very good idea what I'm doing, right? So if they tell me, and there will be that insurance something, I have no idea what insurances are. So there will be that product. So mm, can we do it in five sprints? I say, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, because I'm afraid to ask. Because they may discover that I'm not an expert, so they will fire me. That's something that's happening in my head. So OK, five sprints later, I tell everyone, oh, we misunderstood. Sorry, we cannot deliver. Or I'm an ar architect. You tell me, I'm the, uh, you know, you're the architect, so you will decide about technologies. And I'm really comfortable with Java 1.4 and JEE 1.2. Have fun, team. <laughs> so it may matter on very different scales, even about people changing their job they may be afraid that they won't switch from their current company to the next company, because even if they will pass interview after three months, someone will discover they are crap, so they will be fired, so it's really worth staying here and not even asking about the race. Yeah, there are, there are people like that. So I got it. Someone else got it. What can we do? How to live? Well, first of all, let's, uh, let's uh, think about it why we developers are susceptible to it, because my claim, and that's not something that I found online, but I will claim that we, as a group, are really, really mm, into it. So there is a stress factor related to us. We are introverts, not really well, okay, not all of us, but a large group of people in IT is introverted. You have to, okay, maybe you don't have to accept it, but that's the fact. And we usu usually, every day, see a failure. So either we get a stack trace, or broken build, or a billion of bugs in whatever ticketing system. Or in the end, we will discover the way we want to work. So guys, how do we want to work? Well, we want to first write failing code to 
fix it, and then to fail again. Welcome TDD, which is cool. And then, uh, when we have that problems, we search for a solution, and we are in most trollic ever uh, industry. So you go online, you ask for help, and they say, ah, ha, ha, loser. <laughs> And then think, okay, online, they laughed at me, I'm coming back to my team. So we do, I don't know, uh, code review. Who's doing code reviews? Anyone doing them in a room full of people with printed out sheet papers or something like that? No. Uh, oh, there are people like that. Yeah, still. Not online, I know. So uh, the rest of you are doing that online, you do it, but in a digital way, it's not so easy to explain. But when I saw those meetings, people were sitting inside a room with a code and someone on a beamer and you could look into the code and then the piece of paper with the code would be put into a ball and thrown in a person's face. Yeah, good job, mate. <laughs> really, I liked it. <laughs> so think about it. Think about the whole environment. How do you do code review? Uh, how do you approach others? How you talk to them? Do you encourage people to even fail? Think about hierarchy. So I'm level 10 developers, you nine level losers. I'm right, right? <laughs> that, that, that's how we are sometimes, not always. Uh, I'm, general, I'm basically extra, extravagating a bit, but okay. So what we can do? First of all, if you have imposter around you, give him feedback, but like an honest one, like not, oh, you did a, such a great job. Yeah, we love, yeah, we really want you. No, like, Okay, mate, uh, the code is fine, it's a working solution, thank you for it, but change the variables. Like, give a real feedback, not something praised for children, those are grown-ups. Uh, thank them, like I just mentioned. Saying thank you doesn't cost you a lot, and when someone did something good for you and we were going to come back to it, it's really worth to just let them know that you appreciate. Uh, talk about it. A lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people are coming after the talks to me and saying, thank you, that really helped me. I, I right now know, and it will be better. <laughs> so spread the knowledge. And if you're an imposter, try to grab that feedback that you will get. Uh, example for me, and keep it for the rainy days. Uh, when I was joining IPAM, uh, during the interview, it, it was scheduled for, I don't know, 40 minutes or something. It was by telephone. <sighs> and I really didn't want to take it. But still, the guy on the other end of the cable, he was a great guy. And I still value Botond. Uh, his name is Botond. He was from, he's from Hungary, but living in Germany. So he talked with me for two hours something. We went through every topic ever, because it was a great discussion. And at the very end, I received a greatest feedback ever saying, yeah, you can code, like compressed. It was, you can code. I really would like to work with you. And Whenever someone th after that said to me, oh, that's crap, you can't do it, just go blow snow in Norway. I said to myself, no, wait, I got a tool. That really great guy said to me, I did something good. When I botch a presentation, because I do a couple of them every year, and not all of them goes well, well, then I go back to the happy moments I had when someone came to me after the presentation and said, Thank you, it really helped. Like yesterday, I was preparing for a presentation and reading Polish blogs, and someone referred to my presentation. It was like, cool, thank you. So those are very simple things that you can do. You can do them on a daily basis inside of a team. You can collect them and remember about them. Write them down if it helps to you. It's up to you. Kill your heroes, not in a way where physically you're in a gun-murdering person. But, I don't know, Sławek Sobutka was uh, on the stage like 10 minutes ago, 20 minutes ago. So, think about Sławek. He's great at public speaking. He's great at DDD. He's great at very many things. You think about him highly, right? He's a great guy. I would like to be like Sławek. I'm, I'm so little. If you will compare me, so little person, to Sławek, who's a great guy, he's on the stage, right? Uh, it's really hard to think if you will think about, it, uh, about yourself well when you think about Sławek, because he knows everything, because you've seen him talking about public speaking and DDD. But what does he know about Oracle da database that you have, or the Struts version that you have, or whatever you have? Well, pro 
probably not much. So <sighs> this is something that I'm doing a lot with uh, Jack speakers. When I try to convince someone, hey, come to the Java user group, start telling us about something. People say always, ah, I don't know anything. And then we do that. Okay, but what you are doing? How are you doing? Okay, that really matters. People will like it, trust me. Forget about the failures. If I will botch this presentation, okay, I had better ones, this wasn't the best, probably I will do another and it will work again. And try to do it as long as you can till you will make it right. Because you can fail. That's something that happens. Okay, but I promised you not to talk only about imposter syndrome, though I do it a lot. Uh, let's talk about knowledge sharing. And knowledge sharing especially inside of a team. Because we are a team. You're here, you're learning. People at your office are not. What you can do about it? First thing first, uh, Dreyfus Brothers model, probably the best known in our industry, thanks to a great book, uh, Pragmatic Thinking and Learning by Andy Hunt. Uh, Swavik mentioned that as well. Uh, so let's dive a bit deeper in here. So the model is referring to each skill in separate. Like I can be expert Java coder or and uh, novice at C Sharp and then competent at JavaScript. It doesn't matter. I, I may be the senior developer or expert developer or whatever you have in your company based on some skill that I'm really good at, but on the other ones, I'm not necessarily so great. Think about the junior Java dev that was previously a JavaScript architect. Is he a better person than I am? Maybe, I don't know, hard to say. Definitely he's not as good as uh, on Java skills uh, but as I am, but uh, he's probably much better on the JavaScript because he did it a lot. So why does it matter? Because there are some rules uh, related to that. You don't put experts with novices and you can be an expert and novice on many axes. And you got people in your team, so start thinking about it, that maybe that guy that's really good at making the database changes that you see as a senior, because he's a senior by title, uh, maybe he's really crappy at Java. So maybe you have to talk with him in a different manner. Think about his skills and a way that he will process it. Yes, he's a expert and he's uh, probably superior to you by the title or, or level in your company, but maybe in some areas he's not so good so you can uh, treat him as a person on lower level, just to make a bit less stress. There's also a different uh, version of thinking about the knowledge. Imagine four card boxes, the red one. In red one, uh, unconscious sa says incompet incompetence are the things that we don't know, we don't know about. So things I have no idea, I don't know about. Yellow box are the things I'm aware that I don't know about, and I will give examples in a minute. Green box are the things I'm aware that, I'm, that I know of. And blue box is very, very difficult, because those are the things I don't even know that I know about. So how it goes. A couple of years ago, I met my ex-girlfriend. She was doing decoupage, which is uh, putting uh, paper flowers and paper butterflies on uh, uh, card boxes and selling them for a lot of money. That's how I understand it. Before I met her, I never even knew that there's a uh, decoupage. So it was in my red box. But by meeting her, I put it into my yellow box. Right now, I'm ignorant about it. I don't care about it, but I know that it exists. Uh, so yellow box and red box, done. Green box. Green box for me is Java. I know how to code in Java. I know how to teach Java. I, I made a lot of effort to be able to do both. And so by a conscious practice reading, Java is in my green box. My blue box is the thing that I don't know I'm good at. So right now I have to go there, so I need to know about it. But uh, let's say swimming. If I would come to you and ask you, how do you swim? Would you be able to tell me all of the rules? Well, that, that those are the things that you're usually an expert in. So how does it matter? And first, how is the full example? 
So when I was young, I had a red box where I had the cars and driving a car. I had no idea that I can drive a car. I was a, just a little boy. Then I started to grow up and read about it, and I knew that I can drive a car because people drive car. I was old enough to understand it. So I started to learn how to drive a car. I went for uh, tests and first to the driving school. So it went into my green box, and right now it's probably in my blue box, despite I'm not an expert, but if you ask me how to park a car, I remember that my uh, instructor told me, hey, when you're passing a car next to you, next to the one that you want to mm, park, just make a 45 degree turn, and then after uh, 20 seconds, make a 90 per, uh, degree turn, and then you will park a car. Right now, I would just say to you, oh, it's easy, just do it. Why does it matter? Uh, you can focus on making one of those areas larger, and that will impact your career and the way that you will uh, develop yourself in time. So by having a huge yellow area, uh, so things that you know that you don't know about, but you have some idea about them, you're becoming more of a generalist, especially if you will start to take some of those things to the green side. So I know that Erlang is great for mm, concurrent programming. Could I write a program in Erlang without using internet? Not a chance. Uh, on the other hand, when you will start moving things into a blue area and ignoring the rest, you are becoming an expert. So maybe I'm interested only in making uh, Java go faster on my server. So they will hire me for a lot of money uh, just to fine tune it, and then I'm done. So I will be interested only in the topics that are related to the blue area. Uh, OK. So. When you are coming out of school, and how does it impact others? When you are coming out of school, you're basically with some basic knowledge. Uh, you can take tests, as it says, but you don't know a lot. So you go to a conference, for example, and there's something called curse of knowledge. So you will look at people like Slavik here in a minute, uh, 20 minutes ago. So he was talking about public speaking. You will look at him, and you will imagine all of the people between Swavek, who's at the very top of the line, and all of the people behind him, but in front of you, that know more about public speaking than you do. And there's a long line. There will be another long line to Uncle Bob, uh, of, every people, of, of every person in the world that knows more about testing than I do. So there's billions of people. I look at Uncle Bob. I want to be there with him. I want to know as much. But there's also a line to Martin Fowler uh, about refactoring. I will be learning about it, and I will looking at Martin and trying to get past all of the people in between to be as great as him, right? What I will never do, and what most of us will never do, though, we'll never look behind, whereas there's equally long line, or probably even longer, of people that have no idea about it, of the things that we are aware in the given domain, and they don't know about it. And those people are in your team, those people are in your company, those people are in your family. You know a lot, trust me. Uh, how to start working on it? Well, usually you won't go onto stage right away just because you will be afraid, okay, they will be laughing because I don't know so much as Slavic, so I shouldn't be talking on same conference about public speaking or DDD as he does. So you will try to avoid events, and on each event there will be someone that you will see, he probably knows more. So start by something simple. Go to your company and say, I want to participate in the internship program. I want to mentor someone. I want to show them how to get into the company. Uh, I was running a Java Academy program, so they came to me, really, and said, Michal, you have to do it. I said, no, I, I know nothing. I have no bloody idea how to do it. And they said, no, you can just do it. So I started to prepare myself to start doing that, to start teaching people how to code in Java and how to be good uh, after graduating. So when the students came, and I started to ask them, OK, uh, what do you do when you want to build a project? Uh, what do you do when you want to deliver it to the production? Stuff like that. 
when we went through the whole list, I discovered, okay, they know nothing about Maven or any other kind of a build tool, tool or even why do we use it. They know nothing about testing, they know nothing about Jenkins and many other things. So right away we had a program and I understood, okay, there are people behind me that know less so I can teach them. And it still may be stressful because <laughs> those are the students that are kind of an expert in the domain but not yet there. <laughs> So start with children. Uh, at IPAM we do, for example, during weekends, uh, trainings for kids. You can bring your own kid. There are a couple of guys that want to share knowledge with kids. Have fun. On JAG, we were doing exactly the same thing. We went to the kindergarten and just started to teach kids about the algorithms in a very simple way. There's, you can lower the barrier to such a low level that it's really hard to say, I cannot do it. And even if that is too hard, because it's interacting with humans, there are Java user groups, there are conferences, there is GitHub. You can blog or you can even go to Stack Overflow and plus one, a good answer. That's also valuable. You contribute. That's the first step. Okay, what events do we have? And how can you start there? So, brown bags. I will encourage each one of you, you're coming back from a conference where there were probably around 10 lectures uh, to which you participated. You heard a lot of ideas. Uh, let's make minus one for this one, but you heard a lot about interesting, technologically interesting stuff that may be useful or applicable for others. Take 15 minutes, go to the people, and don't say, I like it, I don't like it, don't rate it. Just say, okay, it was there, there is a tool for that, it sounded cool, good enough. You just put it something from people red bucket into their yellow bucket. Maybe they will use it one day. Maybe on some code review they will say, hey, I heard about the tool from that guy or girl that was on a conference. Let's try it out. Do workshops. You basically can do it on a team level. You can gather people from company. An hour of talking, a day of talking. If you were yesterday on a graphs, you basically have a, even a template of it. You can uh, go out to the company and show them. I will mention code retreats, uh, especially right now. On 22 uh, of October, there's a global day of code retreat. People will meet in offices and uh, some public spaces. Basically, I don't have a link here, but Google Global Day of Code Retreat 2016. And next, uh, next Saturday, uh, people will go into one place, six uh, sit down for six sessions, during each session, they will be coding uh, Conway's gate of, uh, Game of Life. For what reason? And they will be coding in pairs. For what reason? Just to be better. They don't deliver anything. They don't need to do uh, a code that will be pretty or saved. After 45 minutes of coding, uh, they do 10 minutes of retrospective. Then they delete the code. No one will ever know about you imposters that you cannot code because you cannot write and then they will change places. They will code with a new pair. Maybe they will make a small twist like, I don't know, mute pair programming, so you cannot talk with one another just to improve the uh, code quality. And it's all focused on software excellence. And it's really simple. Even dumb managers can do it, trying to look like a plane. Hackathons. Uh, that's another kind of an event where you deliver which is super important. It's 2016, my time is ending, so I will go fast. But there are people in this world that never had a chance to deliver. They never seen a code on production. If you're one of those people, go to Hackathon. They will find you a team, they will find you a purpose, they will allow you to release something. It's super important to see that your code does matter and brings value. Okay, <sighs> quickly about working together. Uh, there are some good practices like pair programming, mob programming, try it out. Uh, it's a great way to transfer knowledge to others. Use code reviews in a positive way, not to bash someone because he's stupid, because his variables are so long. Like, no, use it in a positive way, same as retrospective. Don't use retrospective to say, oh, it's a crappy place where we are working at. The milk, the milk is 2%. Who would want to sit in that office? Be constructive. 
use, use it for a greater good. You have a great opportunity to improve something. So use all of those events and ceremonies that look silly from Scrum perspective or from whatever framework you're using just to be doing some good job. <sighs> okay, recognition. That, that will be like last idea I want to put in your head. Recognition on a team level, on a company level, it can be done quickly, dirty, and, and simply, which is more, most important, because simple solutions are usually the best. Uh, I got a team lead, and it's a great pleasure to work with Bartosz. One day, he brought exactly that card box, a simple gray thing. He put it on the table, put a couple of candy bars, a couple of coats, uh, cans of soda, and said, hey, there's a simple rule. If someone will do anything good for you, you uh, and you, if you put it something inside earlier, then you can take anything what's inside and give it to the person. You, you cannot take it for, for yourself. You have to recognize others. So if, for example, you did a code review for me, and it was hard, and no one wanted to do it, I just can't take it can the bar and give it to you by saying thank you. So it's even easier way of recognizing people. Celebrate together. Have a pizza after the sprint. Give yourself rewards inside of a team. It's super easy. You can post a picture that's something usually bad to do on the, the development teams. But if you recognize that this is the person that did most for us during that sprint, you can put his face on a uh, wall or just everyone puts five slot into the uh, can and buy him a beer or something, it's, it's cheap to recognize people. You can do it same on the company level. Uh, for example, we had a town halls. They were boring. No one wanted to go there because management was coming and saying stupid, boring stuff. So one of the guys said, hey, let's do our own town halls. What did happen to you? What mattered for you in the past month? One of the guys just was walking through the office, collecting those things, and then running that. So right now, uh, management said, town halls are stupid. We don't do them. Can we come here and speak here? And it works. And the best part is that the guy who started that said, yeah, you could come, but you have to pay us. And they did. And he's buying rewards. He's buying small gifts for the people that did most for the whole company, not like the project, but for the whole company, given month. Uh, we got also a batch system, but that's like an overkill. If you're corporate-minded, you can have a system that will allow you to do the exactly same thing you can do with a candy bar. So you can give someone something that costs a few or nothing, and it will recognize them. And I will leave you with a quote for, from a very poor movie, but still, it's a very powerful quote. Next year, if you will not decide to even participate in this conference as a speaker. You have no excuse for at least trying. I will understand that you haven't passed the call for papers, but at least you can try to do it. It's your fear if you're not going to put any idea into the box by saying, hey, I know something about Java 1.2. Does anyone inter is interested in that? It's your choice if you have any questions. You probably should grab me online or when I'm cruising around because it's a lunchtime. Thank you. <laughs>